Hi, bonjour à tous. My name is Ariane Fortier. I am a registered dietitian with Dairy Farmers of Canada, and I will be your moderator for today. Welcome to the third webinar organized by our team of dietitians. We are thrilled to say that we have closed more than 2,000 participants today from coast to coast. A Q&A period will follow the presentation, but you can ask your questions at any time. Note that we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Si vous le désirez, nous offrons un service de traduction simultanée. Voir le bouton à cet effet au bas de l'écran. To download the presentation, simply click the link at the bottom of your screen. Now let me introduce Dr. Denis Savayano. Dr. Savayano is the Virginia C. Meredith Professor of Nutrition Policy at Purdue University in Indiana. He directs the North Central Nutrition Education Center of Excellence, a USDA NIFA funded center. He is also the Associate Director of the Community Health Partnerships for Indiana's Clinical and Translational Science Institute. Dr. Savayano has studied lactose digestion digestion for the last four decades. The results of these studies indicate that almost all maldigesters can consume significant amount of dairy food without experiencing symptoms of intolerance. Furthermore, he is interested in methods of intervention that will allow lactose intolerant individuals to learn that they can consume dairy foods without experiencing gastrointestinal symptoms. Welcome, Dr. Savayano. It's my pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted. I'm amazed that we have 2,000 registered participants. I think that's a record. I've, I've never talked to that many people at one time, but it's, a, it's truly a privilege to be with you. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, for the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes is take you through a set of research studies that really bring you up to date on the current state of knowledge with regard to lactose intolerance. Uh, so if I go to the second slide, I need to disclose that I am an equal opportunity uh, researcher. I have uh, been involved with a variety of companies, organizations, federal and state agencies. Uh, I work on the Ritter Advisory Board for Ritter Pharmaceuticals. I'm on the Dana Nutrition Advisory Board. I have research support currently from the uh, American Jersey Cattle Association, the A2 Milk Company, and was indicated I also have research support from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the NIH, and I think there are at least 18 different dairy-related organizations I've worked with in the past. So my philosophy in this regard is uh, as long as I can do ethical, appropriate research, I'm pretty much open to resource support in a, from a variety of folks. But let's get started talking about lactose intolerance. Uh, first, there are two must-reads, and I, you'll see these again at the end of the study. The first is a National Institute of Health Consensus Development Conference that was held in February of 2010, and the results of that conference are uh, described in detail uh, in their NIH uh, website. Those websites are there for you. In addition, the... Uh, uh, Committee on Nutritional Pediatrics for the Pediatric Society has an excellent publication on lactose intolerance related to infants and children and adolescents. So I would urge you to take a look at those two resources. They're both outstanding resources. Uh, lactase activity and the development of lactase non-persistence is one of the most interesting uh, biological a phenomena in the history of mankind. Uh, all mammals are born with very high levels of intestinal lactase, and that's logical because they are designed from an evolutionary perspective to drink their mother's milk. And after weaning sometime uh, early in life, for almost all mammals, and most humans actually, the level of this lactase activity goes down dramatically. Uh, it goes down probably 90 to 95 percent. Uh, we're going to spend our, the rest of our time talking about this normal loss of lactase activity and the consumption of dairy foods 
by people who have lower lactase levels. Uh, but we should also recognize that there is a secondary acquired lactase uh, loss of lactase activity that's important, particularly in clinical situations, and we'll come back to this at the end of the talk. And thirdly, there is a, a congenital lactase deficiency, a complete absence of lactase. This is very rare. There probably have only been 10 to 20 reports of this congenital lactase deficiency in the research literature, but it does also exist. If we go on and look at the presence of the lactase non-persistence among populations, what we find is really two quite distinct populations. About three-fourths of the world's population have lost much of the intestinal lactase activity sometime after weaning, maybe between the ages of three and six, whereas about a quarter of the world's population has retained this activity. And we actually understand the molecular biology of this to some, some extent. It's a single nucleotide polymorphism. It's actually multiple single nucleotide polymorphisms in different populations in order to maintain the activity. We're not going to talk about molecular regulation of lactase today, but it is a very interesting and well-studied phenomenon. Um, the net result of that is that almost all Asians, Native Americans, uh, folks, uh, Africans, have a, a high level of lactase non-persistence, whereas the Northern European and Middle European populations have a much higher prevalence of lactase persistence. If you look at that across the continents in the world, what you find is these estimates are United Nations estimates. About 80% of the population are what we would describe as lactase non-persistent and then hence have the potential for lactose intolerance. And of course, with the, the huge migration that's taken place around the world, uh, both the, the migration of humans from uh, continents to continents and also the, the tremendous growth of agriculture globally what we're finding is uh, lactase non-persistent individuals living in dairying cultures and dairying cultures moving to lactase non-persistent environments. Uh, China is a great example of this where we have a very significant dairy industry growing in a population that is entirely lactase non-persistent. Uh, I actually first started studying uh, lactose maldigestion because of a Moroccan graduate student who had come to University of Minnesota, where I was at the time, and he said to me, well, Professor Saviano, I don't understand. Moroccans are all lactose non-persistent, yet we're, we've been a dairying culture for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and that's actually what began my interest, to, our interest in, in dietary management of, of lactose maldigestion. I, I need to remind you, though, that these populations, the digesters and maldigesters, are two separate populations. It's not one bell curve, but rather it's two bell curves. So that there's a significant difference in the enzyme activities between digesters and maldigesters. And that's important to understand because the persistent population uh, has no potential for the traditional lactose intolerance that exists whereas the hypoelastics of maldigesters have, have this potential. The lactase activity, the enzyme that we're talking about, uh, is here on this slide in red. Um, you can see it's in the distal duodenum and the jejunum. Uh, very high levels, uh, particularly in infancy in all mammals. Um, all mammals except the California sea lion for some reason uh, that whose mother's milk doesn't contain lactose, but all mammals' milk contain high levels of lactose. They vary in the amount. And as a result, the intestine of newborns has this high level of lactase to digest it. Now, I should point out that even infants, because of the large amount of lactose in their diet with breast milk, will maldigest some of that breast milk lactose and can have a symptoms of intolerance. In fact, colic may to some extent relate to that. Uh, the gas that infants have may relate to that as well. So 
maldigestion and colon fermentation is actually a normal phenomenon that we see in infants and is actually one of the key issues that we're going to talk about later in terms of the tolerance of dairy foods and the ability to put dairy foods in the diet of maldigesters. So what happens to lactose that is maldigested, that leaves the small intestine undigested? Uh, what happens to it, it ends up going to the large intestine where it is rapidly uh, digested, fermented, if you will, by the intestinal bacteria. And these intestinal bacteria, uh, bifidus being one of the, the, the classes that uh, digest it, but many of the classes of intestinal bacteria will digest lactose into glucose and galactose, and then from glucose and galactose into a short-chain fatty acids, into hydrogen gas, methane gas, carbon dioxide. And the short-chain fatty acids, mostly acetate in the large intestine, are rapidly absorbed and are an energy source for the intestinal lining and for the, the liver. So they're transported to the liver. The symptoms that occur are often a result of the excessive production of hydrogen and methane gas. Uh, methane is produced not in all individuals, but in some individuals. And methane, of course, has an odor to it. Hydrogen, on the other hand, is odorless, as is carbon dioxide. And so we end up with, uh, oftentimes, with maldigestion, excessive flatulence, but odorless flatulence. Um, as a clinical and research tool, though, this is quite valuable because the only source of hydrogen gas in the mammalian system is the intestinal bacteria. And this hydrogen gas can then be uh, absorbed into the bloodstream, goes throughout the body, diffuses throughout the body, ends up in the lungs as well. And so we can actually measure maldigestion by measuring breath samples and the, the level of hydrogen and methane in those breath samples. So it's been a very important clinical tool for the last 50 years or so that we can use simply by measuring breath gas to understand the amount of maldigestion. So the traditional dogma that's been in place with regard to lactose intolerance is that all lactose maldigesters are lactose intolerant. But maldigesters need to avoid milk, use digestive aids to take supplements, to eat low lactose alternatives, and to not worry too much about the lower calcium intakes or the poor bone health that could result from the lower calcium intakes. Uh, this is actually, uh, we have some unpublished evidence from 10,000 American physicians. And the 10,000 American physicians, three-fourths of them, tended to tell their patients to do this, to avoid milk, to use digestive aids, to take the supplements, to eat low lactose alternatives. Uh, so it really is a traditional dog, at least in American medicine. And I will argue with you and show you data that suggests it's the wrong dog. In fact, what the research science shows is that the reality of the science says that perceived or real milk intolerance causes milk avoidance. It's actually not the maldigestion, but it's the milk avoidance that is the issue. Milk avoidance causes low calcium intakes and poor bone health. But lactose maldigestion is easily managed with regular single servings of milk and other dairy foods. And that there may be other causes of intolerance with milk, it may, maybe the nature of the protein, but these, these need further study. As I said earlier, I'm currently uh, funded by the A2 Milk Company to do a study, and we're we're trying to understand if, indeed, there are some protein differences in milk that might relate to the, the symptoms that some people uh, claim to have. So we're going to spend some time, quite a bit of time, talking about the reality of this science and the data that supports the fact that it's milk avoidance, not intolerance, that causes poor bone health. And, in fact, I'll show you data from a study of several hundred young girls where their bone health was predicted not by their intolerance or the maldigestion, but by their avoidance of milk. Uh, the next three slides are a review of the literature in this regard. Uh, you see on the left the authors, the number of subjects involved, their ages, their race, ethnicity, 
the perception of lactose intolerance and the, the effect that that had on calcium and on bone. And so these studies go back to the, to the 1990s and earlier. And in almost every case, we see a two or 300 milligram reduction in calcium intake. So you can tell people to take supplements. You can tell them to eat low uh, lactose dairy foods. But in fact, people who avoid milk, who perceive lactose intolerance, eat less calcium. And in many of these studies, you can see here the De De Stefano study, the Honickadin study, the Terraza study, bone was also affected. The bone density was affected in these studies. And there's another set on the next page. Again, Loveless and Barr is actually a Canadian study. And in this study, people who self-reported lactose intolerance actually had almost a 600 milligram lower calcium intake than people who didn't self-report lactose intolerance. Um, but in every case, there's a substantial lowering of calcium intake, and in many cases, there's an effect on bone. And finally, here's a, the, the last set of these, and you can see in these two studies, a uh, Finnish study and an Austrian study, about 300 milligrams a day less than calcium intake in people who perceive or self-report lactose intolerance. So these are population studies, not clinical studies. Uh, I'm going to describe for you next the study that we've published that we conducted in the United States. 258 girls, uh, adolescent girls, 10 to 13 years of age, uh, from uh, Hawaii, California, uh, Nevada, Arizona, Ohio, and Indiana. Uh, these girls were quite diverse. They were about a third Asian, a third Hispanic, and a third non-Hispanic white. About 40% were maldigesters, which is a higher number than the U.S. average, which is only about 25%. Interestingly, of the 258 girls, almost 50 of them considered themselves to be milk intolerant. But when these girls were tested for maldigestion with breath hydrogen, only about half of the 50 were actually maldigesters. 22 were actually digesters, even though they considered themselves to be milk intolerant. We were able to complete an uh, educational program with these girls in their schools. We had schools, uh, 20 or 30 schools around these eight states where we implemented a, a bone health educational program. But at the same time, we were able to measure uh, a variety of components of these girls from their uh, bone densities using DEXA. So we actually brought them all into our laboratories and measured bone density and their their dairy food and calcium intakes. And interestingly, of those 50 girls that, that claimed lactose intolerance, the lactose maldigestion status had absolutely nothing to do with their total food calcium intake or their dairy calcium intake. So now think about that. These are girls who are actually maldigesters, living free living across the United States, yet maldigestion was not related to their calcium intake, which is quite surprising. We were surprised by it because we thought maldigestion would indeed be related to their calcium intake, but it was not. In, in contrast, well, in addition, we were able to measure a variety of bone mineral densities and con concentrations, and they were not related to their lactose maldigestion status. So girls who were lactose maldigesters did not have lower bone densities, but what did affect calcium intake and bone density, as I'll show you, is their perceived milk intolerance. That is, those girls that indicated that they thought they were intolerant and therefore avoided milk, and remember, half of them were digesters, had about a 200 milligram a day less intake of calcium. 168 milligrams of that came from dairy calcium. You can see that the non-dairy calcium was not different. And so this was about a half a cup of milk a day in terms of serving. So these girls were, were, were getting about a half a cup less of uh, milk per day if they perceived themselves to be milk intolerant. And over time, that reduction in milk intake was the factor that was related to their bone density. So here's a group of girls who are 10 to 13 years of age who perceive themselves to be milk intolerant, 
who drink less milk, and as a result, already at the age of 10 to 13, they have lower bone density. And as we know, lower bone density at an early age is one of the predictors for bone breakage and osteoporosis in later life. So these young girls are already setting themselves up. Now they, and they haven't even gone through puberty yet. Puberty, of course, is the, the key time for bone density growth. And we know also during puberty and adolescence, there's oftentimes a movement away from milk and towards sugared beverages. But even before that time, these girls were already having lower bone densities than their peers who were drinking milk, regardless of their maldigestion status. Pretty remarkable. Uh, we were really, really shocked by this. We put this in pediatrics about 10 years ago. Um, so if you look at the rest of this literature, related to uh, perceived lactose intolerance and uh, bone density, what you find is a variety of studies. Um, here's DiStefano, Hanukkah, and Carraza again, looking at uh, a variety of different countries where reported lactose intolerance had a significant effect on calcium and on bone. And in this case, reported fractures, um, density, density uh, in these studies, um, if you notice in, in these studies, Elbon and Pledges and um, Terracio, uh, again, lower calcium intake, um, perceived uh, intolerance related to lower calcium and bone health. It's really a problematic issue uh, for people who live in Western cultures and more and more a problematic issue around the world if life expectancy is now what, up near 80 years and most of our nutritional advice is, is related to early development, yet it appears that adequate bone density in later life is one of the keys to, to avoiding osteoporosis. So here's the scientific reality as I see it, that milk avoidance, not maldigestion, whether it's real because of maldigestion or it's perceived, leads to lower calcium intake. That lower calcium intake then leads to lower bone densities, which result in increased fracture rates, particularly later in life. So let's turn now and talk about managing uh, lactose maldigestion because many folks who are lactose maldigesters or perceive themselves to be lactose intolerant avoid dairy foods. And I will argue that's exactly the wrong strategy, that in fact, uh, it's quite easy to manage dairy foods for lactose maldigesters if you have a few simple rules that are based on existing research. Uh, dose is absolutely critical. I'll show you evidence that a glass of milk is well tolerated, two glasses of milk less so. Timing of dose is another issue. I always urge people to drink milk with a meal. And I'll show you data that shows it's about three times better tolerated. Interestingly, people who regularly drink milk adapt their colon bacteria. I'll show you data that shows we can absolutely adapt colon bacteria. In fact, we can make digesters out of maldigesters by regularly giving them lactose and changing their colon bacteria. Uh, the residual mammalian lactase is probably important in this issue as well. And food sources, of course, vary in lactose so that we can look at the, the different levels of lactose. Um, and, you know, learned aversions, I think, an important consideration here. Um, everyone has aversions to certain kinds of foods. Um, when I was growing up in California, my Italian-American mother would overcook broccoli and I hate, with, with lots of garlic. And I really didn't like it. I mean, it was very strong and took me years to learn to like broccoli again, and now I love it, but it's, it's an aversion that I had to overcome. So here's data we, we did back in the 90s, uh, 80s actually, um, where we fed uh, the same amount of lactose, so this is exactly the same amount of lactose, to the same people in crossover design looking at their symptoms. So we fed lactose by itself in water, and you can see here we had the, the greatest number of of symptoms. We fed that lactose in milk. Symptoms were reduced slightly. 
a company was sponsoring this that made a food supplement, and you can see that there wasn't much difference there. We fed people a lactose-free meal, and of course they had no symptoms. Then we added the meal and the supplement together, and if you notice, the symptoms were trivial. They were less than one. One was trivial. Whereas that supplement alone, the symptoms were about two, over two, and lactose in water was over three. So by adding other food solids to lactose, you can reduce symptoms by at least threefold. This is primary advice I think all dietitians should give their, their patients. That is, always drink milk with a meal, and you'll have far fewer symptoms. The potential for symptoms is dramatically reduced because stomach emptying is dramatically reduced and it gives the lactose more time to be digested. So that's point one. Point two, of course, is people, I think, are, are uneducated as to the amount of lactose in a variety of foods. I oftentimes am um, approached by people who say, well, you know, I'm lactose intolerant. If I, put, uh, if I eat hard cheeses, I'll have symptoms. Or if I have a, a small amount of yogurt, I might have symptoms. But in fact, you know, lactose is water-soluble. Lactose is part of the whey, not the curd. And so when you make cheeses, you actually eliminate almost all the lactose that's in dairy foods. So hard cheeses have almost no lactose. Cheeses have a very low level of lactose. You can see here a glass of milk has 12 to 13 ounces, uh, 12 to 13 grams of lactose. In eight ounces. Yogurt's about the same. We'll talk about yogurt. It's extremely well tolerated. We'll talk about why a little bit later. Um, but dairy foods do vary dramatically. We did studies in the past with ice creams. Ice creams have about half as much lactose as milk on a, on a volume basis. And they are, are much better tolerated as well because the dose is smaller and you're adding more solids to the ice cream. Um, so people need to realize that there are different levels of lactose in different foods. And from, in most cases, it's only milk that gives people symptoms. Cheeses rarely give people traditional lactose intolerance symptoms. Here's a very early study back in the 1970s um, that reiterates this point about solids in foods and transit time. Leiker did a very simple study where he gave the same subjects lactose and water, skim milk, and whole milk. And as you would expect, the more solids, the more nutrients, the more calories you added to the lactose, the lower the symptoms. In fact, in this study, whole milk had less than half the symptoms as lactose and water. Not that I'm promoting whole milk because of its fat content. I think it depends on the individual, of course. And whether they need the calories or not. But clearly, as you add components to lactose and water, you reduce symptoms. And this is another example of that. So I, I told you earlier about my Moroccan graduate student who came in my office back in the 1980s and said to me, Dr. Saviano, I don't understand why Moroccans can eat dairy foods yet we're all lactose maldigesters. Well, it turns out Moroccans and others in the Middle East have a long history of eating yogurts. And so we began studying yogurts uh, with this, this young man. His name was Mustafa Aouji, and looked at the research literature, and it appeared to us there was some indication, particularly from animal studies, that yogurt was special. It had unique properties. Um, and we weren't quite sure what those properties were completely, but we did an initial study, and this is actually the study with um, yogurts are well tolerated regardless of their lactose content. If you see the orange line with the relatively low breast hydrogen, that would indicate less maldigestion. So these are breast samples over time in subjects who are fed these different meals. Again, a randomized crossover design. And if you feed people milk, which is kind of the chartreuse purpley line, you see you get a lot of maldigestion. And the yellow line is lactose in uh, water, and you get a lot of maldigestion. If you feed the same amount of lactose in yogurt, you get one-third the amount of maldigestion. For a reason we'll explain in a minute, 
lactose in yogurt is much better digested than lactose in milk. Okay, we put this up in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1984, and yogurt sales in the United States went up about 20% for three or four months, and then they came back down again, of course. But uh, yogurt is extremely well tolerated. Uh, these subjects had no symptoms on 440 grams of yogurt, but with 400 grams of milk with about the same amount of lactose, about half of them had symptoms. And we repeated this study with a variety of commercial yogurts. Um, you can see here uh, we have four different commercial yogurts that we looked at compared to milk, and they all work. They all produce almost no maldigestion. Um, this has been repeated in France. It's been repeated by a number of other groups. And we were really kind of surprised it works so well. In fact, I spent about 10 years trying to make a super yogurt that would work even better. But the commercial yogurts on the market are so well tolerated, we really couldn't uh, do that. We, we did some genetic engineering, added a higher lactate level. But the reality is that commercial yogurts were extremely well tolerated. Um, Actually, I'm going to go back, if that's all right, because um, I want to make one more point about uh, yogurts. There we are. I'm back to breath hydrogen from milk, yogurts three, four, five, and 6. Um, so we, we went into the uh, stomachs and intestines of these individuals that collected samples, and what we found was that the yogurt bacteria contained very high levels of lactase, a, a, a microbial lactase that's part of the yogurt culture, and that this yogurt bacteria lactase was active in the small intestine. A French group of colleagues of ours in Paris actually collected distal small intestinal contents after feeding yogurt and found that this entire effect was actually caused by the microbial lactase in yogurt acting in the small intestine. So that by the end of the small intestine, what goes into the large intestine was essentially lactose-free. Thinking of that another way, yogurt is like drinking a glass of milk with an enzyme supplement, and it works extremely well. So that's another piece of advice for people that are maldigesters. So that brought us to looking at if, if yogurt bacteria work well, what about the body's own intestinal bacteria? Can it be adapted to improve lactose digestion? So this is a study of individuals who are bowel digesters who we adapted to lactose in water or dextrose in water, i.e. sugar water, and then challenged them with a lactose load. These are the same people. So the, the green line in this colon adaptation slide is when they were adapted to dextrose in water. And dextrose, of course, completely digested in the small intestine, no maldigestion, no influence on the large intestinal bacteria. And you can see that there's tremendous amount of maldigestion. The, the breath hydrogens went up to about 70 parts per million. People produced a lot of gas. Actually, they had more symptoms, too. They had a flattest rating that was almost double, and they had a flattest frequency that was more than double. We have people count their flattest. It's an interesting endpoint for maldigestion. But you can see that when they were adapted to dextrose, they had a, quite a bit of symptoms after we gave them a lactose challenge. Same people, randomized order. We give them lactose three times a day with their, with their meals, over about a 10-day period, adapt them to lactose so that their colon bacteria are now seeing lactose regularly. Then we give them a lactose challenge in the morning for breakfast, and they make almost no hydrogen. Not only do they make no hydrogen, but they have much lower levels of symptoms. They have about half as much symptom rating to where it's almost incidental. By the way, the the baseline level of flattest frequency is probably somewhere 7 to 10 per day, so that 11 is probably not even different than baseline. So this shows tremendous colon adaptation to lactose, and it actually another, adds to the another one of the, the things we tell our, our subjects who are lactose intolerant. Put milk in your diet a couple of times a day. Don't put in large amounts. 
and over a period of a couple of weeks, you will adapt. We usually tell them to start with small amounts so that they'll feel comfortable with it. And they won't feel like they're, they're, they're having it. We want to avoid symptoms, obviously. And that, that amount can be worked up to about a glass or a cup, eight ounces, with a meal for breakfast and for dinner. And people doing that won't have symptoms. The next issue was dose, of course. And, you know, the, the dose issue is an interesting one because there are people who claim if they put cream in their coffee, they will have symptoms of intolerance. This is a study done, again, randomized, blinded, crossover study with five different doses of lactose from zero grams to 20 grams. Now, remember, the, the, the white line, which is 12 grams, is what you would find in a cup of milk. So when you give people a half a cup of milk or less, they make almost no hydrogen. They're not maldigesting it. None of it gets to their colon, and they're having no symptoms. When you get to a cup of milk, the white line, you see some symptoms of intolerance. And the highest dose, 20 grams, you get more symptoms of intolerance. And on the, here's the slide of the intolerance symptoms from that study. And you can see that the doses are on the left, 0, 2, 6, 12, and 20. And the flattest frequency never went up until they got to 20. So even at a cup of milk on an empty stomach, by the way, which is the worst way to drink milk, um, there was no difference in flattest frequency in these maldigesters. Flattest ratings did not go up until they got to 20. There was some feeling. These people, these maldigesters could tell that they had milk. There was some abdominal discomfort that started to occur at a cup of milk get on an empty stomach, but the, no flattest uh, results from this, and no diarrhea at this level either. So a cup of milk seemed to be about the, the, the break-even point. When you go beyond that, you started to see some symptoms, but again, on an empty stomach, which is, again, the worst way to drink milk. So these studies, when we published them, we were getting criticism because we were picking people who were maldigesters not necessarily claim to be intolerant. So we went out and found in Minneapolis people who self-described themselves as intolerant. They avoided milk. They didn't want to drink milk. And we found 30 of them who responded to ads in newspapers and put them into a randomized double-blinded trial of milk versus lactose hydrolyzed milk. And what we did is a very simple study. We gave them a cup of milk with breakfast daily for a week, and it was either milk or lactose hydrolyzed milk. Um, some subjects got the milk the first week with a washout period. Others got the uh, others got the hydrolyzed milk the first week, and then a washout period. And when you look at the symptoms that these people have, now remember these are people that claim severe symptoms of lactose intolerance. They claim that they don't want to drink milk; they avoid it. It's not good for them. What we found is absolutely no difference in symptoms between the milk and the hydrolyzed milk, one cup with breakfast, okay? Again, it's a dose issue, and it's a, it's a transit issue with the breakfast. Um, bloating was incidental. Abdominal pain was incidental. There was really no diarrhea. Uh, flattest, um, two and a half more flattuses per day on the milk than with the hydrolyzed milk. So that actually was just outside the confidence interval. Well, if that wasn't enough, well, okay, and by the way, those were the maldigesters. This slide, the self-described intolerant digesters, look exactly the same. So these are the folks that actually didn't even maldigest the lactose. But they also had, you know, 11.8 versus 8.4, a little more variation, so it, it, did, it still went, it went through zero, but again, about the same increase in flattest. And these were digesters, so there was something going on with some of these digesters, but it was very minimal in terms of having a couple more uh, flattuses per day. So having, being a little uh, compulsive about this kind of a study, we did the same study again, but this time we did two cups of milk, one with breakfast and one with dinner, and a very similar result. We had very modest increases in symptoms, uh, self-reported intolerance, systematically reported more symptoms, 
regardless of the lactose content of the milk. So the lactose content didn't seem to be important at all in, in this issue. Uh, but the symptoms were very modest. Um, so then we said, well, if we can do two a day, let's try five servings of dairy a day. Again, these are folks who are very much intolerant, maldigesters and digesters. Now, it wasn't all milk. It was a variety of dairy foods at 500 per day, uh, at 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day. But you can see that even with 1,500 milligrams of calcium a day, maldigesters and digesters had almost no excessive flatulence, uh, no change in bowel movement, um, very modest changes in total flatulence. Um, you see here really nothing going on with the digesters or the maldigesters in terms of total flatulence. Um, 10 to 17, I guess, is the biggest difference we saw. These are maldigesters, the lactose hydrolyzed compared to the conventional. Um, but again, extremely modest changes in symptoms. And this is five servings of dairy a day. Um, pretty remarkable. So the next thing we did was we, we read, well, what, what else has been done in the literature? So we did a meta-analysis to look at studies where people have actually been blinded, and they were adults, not children. There were crossovers, and there was a, a control. So a lot of the studies that have been done don't have appropriate control or blinding. And when we look at those studies and we use a physiological dose of less than 25 grams of lactose, that's still a lot of milk. That's two cups of milk. That's a lot of milk. We found 1,500 citations, but only 11 of the studies actually met our, our criteria for inclusion. And if you look at those 11 studies, you see no difference in abdominal bloating. You see no difference in pain. You see really no difference in stool. You just see no difference. The, the variation runs right across zero. The zero is the dotted line here. And most of these are my studies, actually. Suarez and Hertzler and, uh, are, are all my studies. Um, here you see bowel movement. Here you see diarrhea. Uh, here you see passage of flatulence. Um, all running across zero in terms of incidence. So most of the studies, when you use a, a blinding and a reasonable dose of lactose, you see very little effect on symptoms. So here's the summary of this. Um, it seems to us that lactose intolerance is caused in a combination by the residual lactase activity, which we really haven't talked about much, dietary lactose, the dose, the history, the colon fermentation history that goes on, and the GI transit effect that really is influenced by meal, or eating milk on an empty stomach versus eating it with um, a meal. Now, let's go back and, and briefly talk about uh, secondary lactose intolerance. This is a major concern for some regions and populations, particularly people with occurred abdominal pain, with IBS, uh, in recovery from cow's milk allergy, from gastroenteritis, and certainly globally with HIV and protein energy malnutrition. Uh, the secondary intolerance is a major issue that, that needs to be addressed and, and you need to be concerned about in your populations as you, as you deal with patients. Uh, we're not going to spend any more time on that today, but, but just note that these are issues that can cause lactose intolerance. The lactase enzyme, like the sucrase isomaltase enzyme, sits out on the edge in the lumen of the intestine and is extremely susceptible to ethanol, so alcoholic, uh, to gastroenteritis, to infection, to malnutrition, and so secondary lactose intolerance can be an issue. So in summary... Uh, perceived lactose intolerance, in my opinion, is a barrier for calcium consumption in maldigesters and even some digesters. And this results in a two to 300 milligram per day lower intake, lower bone mineral densities, and long term lower calcium consumption in both young and older women, and increased fracture rate in, in some of the studies that have existed. Dietary management is relatively easy to, to handle. Uh, lactose intolerance is dose-related. One serving of milk is typically well-tolerated with a meal. Many dairy foods are well-tolerated, yogurts and hard cheeses. 
Colon adaptation and regular consumption of milk significantly improves tolerance, and lactose intolerance should not be an impediment to adding dairy foods to the diet. I thank you so much for your time. I look forward to answering your questions. I think we're just about on time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Silvaino, uh, for this uh, very informative uh, presentation. Now, uh, here's our first question. Could you please um, clarify what's the difference between lactose mal maldigestion and lactose intolerance? Uh, thank you for the question. The, the question, I think, is a really good one. So people who maldigest lactose have a low level of intestinal lactase, and this low level of intestinal lactase allows their lactose to get to the large intestine where it can be fermented by intestinal bacteria. So maldigestion is a genetic trait Whereas lactose intolerance is an event. If people have a, an event, if they have extra gas or extra bloating or discomfort, they have uh, symptoms of intolerance. What I think I would argue with you is that maldigesters only have symptoms of intolerance when they eat excessive lactose, when they eat it on an empty stomach, when they're not regularly eating dairy foods, or when there are secondary issues like uh, infection, HIV, malnutrition, et cetera. Thank you. Um, can heating the milk affect tolerance with uh, maldigesters? Uh, in other words, uh, is um, bringing milk to a light boil point, is it, does it affect? The question is if you heat milk, can you improve its tolerance? Um, the answer is there's never been a really well-done study to demonstrate that. Uh, but the, the bigger important question there is, is some of the intolerance to dairy foods related to the nature of the protein? And do you change the nature of the protein by heating the milk? And I think this gets at the hypothesis the A2 milk company has put forth that perhaps it's the, the kind of protein milk that for some people, not all, but for maybe for some people, could be the, the reason why they feel that, that dairy foods are not well tolerated. I think there's more research to do there. I don't know the size of that population, but if you notice in some of our data, uh, particularly with people who claim severe intolerance, the digesters and the maldigesters did not look different. They looked the same which is pretty interesting. And some of the data the A2 milk company started to develop is, is interesting. Again, how many people are affected by this, I think, is one of the key questions. Is it one in a thousand, one in a hundred? I don't really know. I don't think it's a large population, is my bias. Thank you. Uh, is there an advantage for tolerance to choose milk with lactose rather than choosing lactose-free milk? Um, lactose-free milk is a, is a good choice for people. Lactose-containing milk is a good choice for people. Uh, the cost of lactose-free milk is certainly one of the, the negatives. Um, I think I showed you data that there's a significant amount of adaptation that can go on, so that people that are regular milk drinkers are more likely to be tolerant of that milk. Um, the cost, to me, is the major issue here. Thank you. Uh, in your conclusion that milk avoidance, avoidance leads to lower calcium intake and lower BMD, have you controlled for a vitamin D intake? Given that milk is fortified with vitamin D, how can we be sure uh, that causal factor is calcium and not low vitamin D? What an excellent question. Um, I showed you epidemiological data, relationship data, where people who avoid milk have lower calcium intake. You're absolutely correct. It could be the vitamin D as well as the calcium in the milk, and that, that data doesn't distinguish those two factors, nor does the data that we have with our 250 young girls across the United States distinguish that question. So it's an excellent question. 
it's one we have to resolve. Good. Uh, can we adapt the intestine of lactose intolerant individuals with probiotic supplements, pills, or yogurt? Uh, is there a certain strains of bacteria that, when supplemented, can increase the uh, tolerance of lactose? So, in full disclosure, I am part of the Ritter Pharmaceutical Medical Advisory Board, and I have a, a consulting arrangement with them. But the Ritter company has developed a galacto-oligosaccharide, a prebiotic, that when fed to lactose intolerant people will improve their tolerance substantially. We've had a couple of uh, publications in the research literature in this regard. I didn't present those studies, but they show the microbiome changes dramatically and intolerance improves dramatically. So that from my perspective, it's the prebiotic, not the probiotic, the substrate, if you will. You can, by the way, also do that with milk. If people are willing to drink small amounts of milk a couple times a day and continue that, that consumption over a couple of weeks, they can train their intestinal bacteria to be more tolerant. And they can do it without having symptoms if they start at low enough doses. You know, a, a half a cup of milk or a quarter of a cup of milk with cereal in the morning and a similar amount at dinner. And if you tolerate that after a day or two, up the amount a little bit and eventually get to, and I wouldn't go beyond, eight ounces of milk after a week or two. How long would, you, would someone have to include a bit of lactose in their diet in order to start seeing improvement in their, their tolerance? Oh, we did, uh, the Ritter Company and we debate this issue to, uh, considerably. Their studies are 30 day long, and it works well at 30 days. The early studies I presented to you with adaptation were 10 days long, but we used fairly high doses of lactose over 10 days. So the research data would suggest that it's somewhere between 10 and 30 days. Um, I would argue it's probably closer to 10, but others I work with would argue it might be a bit longer. Okay. Uh, these are really great questions. So um, we had a qu another question. So from what I understand, lactose intolerant people, uh, this is not due to uh, genetics. Uh, Lactose maldigestion is completely due to genetics. People who avoid milk, when we ask them, when we measure if they're maldigesters or not, about a third of them are actually digesters. So there are both people who are genetically lactose maldigesters that avoid milk, but there are also people that are digesters that avoid milk. You know, you might ask, why do digesters avoid milk? And when you ask them the question, the suggestion is, well, they're intolerant. They believe they're intolerant to milk. Again, it may go back to that question of protein. It may be simply a, a, a milk aversion, a food aversion. I, I told you the story about broccoli and my mother, and how I hated broccoli for years. Well, there are people that just don't like milk. And why don't they like milk, I think, is an interesting question. Um, but there are both digesters and maldigesters who avoid milk. Thank you. Can pregnancy affect lactose intolerance and or and or tolerance? Uh, there's a little bit of data on pregnancy and lactose intolerance, and it suggests that there is more tolerance during pregnancy. And the reason there's a couple of possibilities as to why there might be more tolerance. One is that women are encouraged to drink milk when they're pregnant, so they adapt their colon bacteria. The other is that there might be some changes in transit time during pregnancy. A slower transit time might improve tolerance. But the, and again, it's not been very well studied, but there is some suggestion that during pregnancy there's a greater tolerance. Thank you. Is I'd, love to do that, I'd love to do that experiment if somebody would be willing to give me a grant to, it, to do it. I think it's an interesting experiment. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Can, um, uh, can, um, is breastfeeding protective for lactose intolerance, which is quite in line with the previous question? I've never seen evidence that correlates breastfeeding with lactose intolerance. It's an interesting question as well. Um, the, 
the, the normal thinking is that the intestinal lactase is completely genetically controlled, that you cannot manipulate it by environmental issues, so breastfeeding would not change the intestinal lactase activity. And that's been our belief for 30 or 40 years based on some early work that was done. But now there's some new suggestion. There's some evidence, both, of the, both old and new, that there may be some ability to manipulate the lactase activity of individuals. Uh, there's actually a little bit of data about fluorosis and lactose intolerance that we're starting to look at. There's some suggestion about... Uh, the kind of protein, um, there may be some epigenetic issues. So I think it's an interesting question still. It has some, some, some new studies, new experiments to be done. But in general, our history, our belief has been that this enzyme is completely genetically controlled. That may be wrong, but that's been the, the dominant view. Is lactose intolerance more common in females, as most of studies and focus is in regard to females? Oh, what another very good question. Um, you know, I, I can, I, right now we're analyzing a study that we did with the Ritter Pharmaceutical Company. We had several hundred people that actually experienced symptoms of lactose intolerance following a challenge that was then entered in this uh, trial with the lactolicosaccharide. And I could actually start to answer that question looking at that data. I've not done that because there were, you know, there were something like 3,000 people screened to be in that study. And so it would give us a reasonable sample size to look at gender and who was entered in the study. Um, you've given me an idea for an experiment, but I already have the data to answer. So this has been a, a great hour for me. I'm making a note. That's a good idea. Uh, what is the uh, ideal composition of a meal? Do we know it um, uh, in terms of uh, if it's... Uh, if it's well tolerated uh, with lactose, is it uh, a meal high in uh, uh, carbohydrates, protein, fat? Do we know it? Um, never. The, it's not really been studied. The, the, what we do know is that when you eat a meal, it seems like whatever you put in your stomach with lactose that adds calories and slows stomach emptying influences tolerance. That early data I showed you with Leichter, where they did skim milk, uh, lactose in water, and whole milk. You know, there's an example. And then the studies we've done with meals, it would appear that it's stomach emptying. And in fact, the A2 Milk Company argues that the protein difference is related to stomach emptying and those people where they see some difference. So it appears that stomach emptying is, is probably the key there. But again, it's, it's not been extremely well studied. Um, do people become maldigesters as they age? Uh, there are... So let's talk about what is meant by aging. If you mean by aging people in their 60s and 70s and 80s, that's a different question than if you ask when children age through uh, early childhood into puberty. So let's address both those questions and what we know about them, because they're both very good questions. Let's start with the, the child. It would appear that the enzyme goes down somewhere between the ages of three and five, although there are a few studies that suggest it might go down a little later, uh, nine to 12 years of age. But most of the studies suggest it goes down early, post-weaning, three to five years of age. And that would be consistent with what we know in other, in other mammals. Now, if we turn to the elderly, uh, there are a few studies with the elderly. One of them we published many years ago. We went into a, an Asian church in Minneapolis and measured lactose tolerance in the elderly and in the younger population, and it looked exactly the same. The these were all maldigesters. Uh, there's no evidence that somebody becomes a maldigester once they were a digester. 
but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that people's tolerance changes depending on their intestinal adaptation. Um, if you ask folks who believe they've become lactose intolerant, what happened to them, I think anecdotally they'll often say, well, I had this diarrheal disease, or I had an infection in my intestinal tract. I had something that insulted my intestine, and it, you know, it has not recovered. And that could be a microbiome, intestinal bacterial issue. It could be even a, a, a gut, uh, small bowel enzyme issue. It's probably microbiome. But that's about all we know. But there's no evidence that, that, that there's been four or five studies with the elderly, and they all suggest that there's really no difference um, based on age. Now, maybe based on disease, there might be some difference, particularly with secondary lactose maldigestion. Thank you. This was the last question. So uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Saviano, on behalf of Dairy Farmers of Canada. Uh, before you leave, um, uh, I, would like, uh, I would like to, uh, to mention to the participants, uh, please don't forget to complete uh, your, the evaluation form and uh, to print the um, certificate of attendance. Thank you very much for your active participation. See you in 2018.